very important occasion for all of us. Thank you, Maharaji, once again. And thank you, everybody, for kindly facing the occasion. And I would just uh, now request Arvind to kindly say the Anandamuha Vandana. After that, Maharaji will address us.
and head of the uh, Germany Center, head of the Berlin Center of Ram Shivedan Society uh, on this auspicious day. And Swami Padeha Vaneshananda Ji is such a senior Vedantic scholar, he's such a very accomplished and learned monk. So we have privileged to hear on this auspicious day of birthday of Swami Vivekananda. We are directly hearing from him about uh, teachings of Swami uh, Vivekananda, the patriotic monk of India, and uh, who revolutionized the whole world, uh, and especially the message of September 11, 1993. Uh, if we keep this message in mind, I think there will be no dispute and there will be assimilation of every culture. So I think it's a beautiful mm -hmm. lecture that we should try to uh, utilize and that will reduce the conflict in the global context. That will be a thankful to Narendra and Matusha. We welcome them. We uh, yeah. welcome all the guests already. And so now we will certainly request Vanishan Ji Maharaj Ji to kindly address us and uh, give us some enlightenment about the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. Manishan Vidhu Bharat. Bharatakri Sada Lilo Rama Krishna Samadhi Yur Dharma Sthapa Naratu Dire Sarutam Namamuti Is that good? Okay. Like you can hold it a little closer. Closer. Okay. This is good. <coughs> So, a very good afternoon to all of you and I deem it a privilege to be present here on this very auspicious day, the day of Sri, Sri Swami Vivekananda birth. It is connected with the Jodhya. Zodiac constellation at which time born. It is not connected with that date. That is 12th January. So we hold the special occasion on this um, special day. Remembering Swami Vivekananda, a great uh, spiritual personality, is not tallying their births with a date. As in the Western tradition also we have seen that the Easter can be shifted this year during this time, next year during the time it is exactly like that. <coughs> and I am thankful to you all for hosting me, though I have been a guest with Mr. Ganguly, but in fact uh, I feel myself to be the guest of the center. So I'm thankful to you all for this great opportunity to be here to see for myself the pioneering work and the beginning of a uh, great center in this part of the world. And the birthday of Swami Vivekananda is in many ways very important to me personally because I myself, like many of our monks, was inspired by Swami Vivekananda initially by his teachings, by the lectures of Swami Vivekananda. As a student, we were not uh, endowed with the experiences of spiritual life, but we had our questions. Sometimes they were not very palatable to those who would be practicing spiritual life. But we had those questions, like anyone. 
So as young people, we had those questions and we were searching for the answers. And for me, fortunately, that my family was connected with this idea, these ideas, uh, or some other ideas also. And I came in contact with uh, Swami Vivekananda's books uh, during that time. <coughs> what inspired me personally was the practical aspect of the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. I had the great fortune of living in the student's home of the Ramakrishna order and I had seen monks from a very close quarters. And that grew a kind of uh, conviction in me that uh, the spiritual life is uh, practicable, doable. I too can practice those things. And one of our Swamis in those days, he was very kind to give me a clue he said that when you yourself start practicing, then you see the truth in these teachings. Intellectually it is not convincing, or intellectual answers won't also be able to remove your doubts. If you start practicing, then you will see that whatever has been said or have been said in the scriptures, they are really true. It is like practicing the yoga, yoga asana. When you start practicing the plow posture, suppose they call it halasana, it is not that on the very first day you will be able to achieve the whole posture. So you, with the help of a practical teacher, stay, go step by step, day by day, and one day you see that you are able to lift your both legs and touch the toe to the ground behind your own head. That brings you the conviction that it is doable, practical. Otherwise, reading in the books, you don't get that flavor. Even if you see somebody else doing that, you don't get that benefit. So what inspired me very much there was that the lecture of Swami Vivekananda on practical Vedanta. He has two lectures on that. And from the beginning till the end, it was a miraculous experience for me, what he was saying. And even today, when I myself read those lectures, I find much more meaning, much more practicality in those words. It is because <coughs> Swami Vivekananda did not speak from the standpoint of intellectual understanding. What he spoke, it was from the practical application of those uh, scriptural uh, teachings of quotations. At uh, one place in those lectures, Swami Vivekananda says that uh, our idea is not to bring down the ideals, the height of the ideals, to our level. But it is our duty to, through practice, to lift up or raise our own position to that idea. That is a new, very new concept for me. I thought practicable or practicality means that you put something down somewhere and it becomes practical. But suddenly I saw that it has a different meaning altogether and that made all sense. That made all sense. You see, in olden days we used to know or it was the <coughs> practice to understand that the sun is moving around the earth and the heavenly bodies are there going on around the earth itself because earth is the center of the universe. And it was so difficult to calculate the distances, the movements of the planets and other things. It was not possible because we found a center which is completely wrong. 
And then the sudden discovery that the earth is not the center but the sun is made everything that simple. All calculations become simple. So suddenly I found that everything makes sense. What they are saying that makes sense because we are not bringing down the ideal to our standard. But we are lifting our standard to that ideal. And then you see that it is doable. And that is what we all want to do in and through our practices in all fields. When you are studying or some, suppose you are doing some researches in the labs, then you see that when you start doing yourself, you see that many of you seemingly logical ways won't work in the practical field. Intellectually, we may find there would be so many different ways to solve a problem, intellectually or logically. But practically, when you approach that problem, you put things uh, in the practice or in the lab, then you will see that many of those suppositions or ideas will be cancelled. One or two will be applicable and that will prove to be most valuable thing and that proves the research. So it is like that. We eliminate many of our intellectual do's and don'ts and I, you know, if or buts when you start practicing. So this practical Vedanta actually is the thing which inspired me, impressed me, and I knew that this life is practical. And Swami Vivekananda did not get this idea from his own understanding, but he saw Sri Ramakrishna in front of him, saw a practical spiritual life, how he could believe, how the spiritual practices can be taken seriously and how our life can be connected with time. So if our we have an ideal in life, then you know there is an equation. If we have an ideal in life, then our time that we spend will be measured in life scale. If we have an ideal in life, then whatever time we spend, we spend for our for living, not just to kill time, but it is just to spend time for living. And if there is no ideal in life, then our life will be measured on time scale. Somebody lived so many years, what is that to us? It does not make any change. Just somebody spent some time on this world. Everyone does that. So life is not a bundle of time pass. It is livable. Each and every moment is livable. That brings so much sense and that inspires us. And that is what Sri Ramakrishna put before Swami Vivekananda as an example. And that is why I see that the practical Vedanta has combined the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna in a very unique way. Though the words were spoken by Swami Vivekananda, but the inspiration came from Sri Ramakrishna. But then again, when we study further and growing in our life, when we look at the life of Holy Mother, then you will see that uh, very high ideals, very high spiritual teachings can be put into day-to-day -day practice. Whatever, very simple things, whatever we do, that can be converted into a spiritual practice. And that is a continuous spiritual practice of Holy Mother. Throughout her life she lived as an example. So therefore, this was one lecture which really inspired me and I would be speaking based on those ideas. But I would try to um, combine two other areas which are also practical. <clears throat> Actually speaking, when Swami Vivekananda spoke about the combination of four yogas, uh, outwardly we may say that he combined the three faculties of every human being. 
in the teachings of Vedanta, there is no discrimination. In the teachings of Vedanta, there is nothing which is exclusive, which excludes. It is all inclusive, it is meant for all. It does not address the problem or the section of the humanity. It addresses the problem of all of us. When we are all humans and whatever they are saying, those things are meant for the humans. So we see that uh, Swami Vivekananda very grossly put those faculties in place. And he said that spiritual life is a combination of the head, heart and hands. The head, heart and hands. Then it became very easy for us how we can utilize the whole of our being, all the three faculties in us, the intellectual, the emotional and the practical. These three of our faculties can be utilized. And Suddenly you see that the, the high ideals in spiritual life, they are easily practicable. So Swami Vivekananda said that head, and heart, head, heart and hand, these three combinations. Now you look at the combination of the four yogas as has been the teachings of uh, the Vedas, Sri Krishna, Swami Vivekananda and others. See, the idea of head, what we know as Jnana. Jnana Yoga means in day-to-day -day terms, when you are going to a supermarket, you have the same vegetable, but uh, with different price tags. Same vegetable, but different price, price tags. Now, you have to choose between them. Same vegetable, suppose three, from three countries, three different sizes, colors, etc. But same vegetable. And you have to choose what you want. So you would always try to see the differentiation between the price or differentiation between the freshness of the vegetable. And also their market value. So then you decide on what to buy. So we do analyze, we do, they generally use the word discriminate. It is not that, uh, that means it's not a very happy word to use, but the idea is to differentiate. Differentiate means what is good for me, what is bad for me. And what is good, that is called good which helps me throughout in my life. Otherwise, there may be some temporary good things which may be good for now, but tomorrow it may not be good. I used to like uh, sugar or any sweet thing when I was not a diabetic. But the day they found that I am a diabetic, then the sugar becomes bad for me. So that is very relative. Idea. But the good which persists all along, without creating any trouble, rather helping us, in our spiritual life, that is called what we do. So, differentiation or viveka in the Jnana Yoga means in practical life we have to decide what is beneficial or helpful in our spiritual attainments. What is the spiritual attainment? We want to be free from, in the most layman's language, suffering. Free from suffering. We don't want to, want to immediately term it as a free from bondage, but at least free from suffering. And that suffering is a spiritual suffering because Buddha has said that this whole life is suffering, 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 nothing but suffering. So we have to now <coughs> differentiate between those things which will increase our suffering and those things which will decrease our suffering. That is what is called vivek or differentiation, which is wrongly translated as discrimination. In the West, you cannot use this word. Even here also, I think that should be the space for that 
word has now got a different flavor. So that is the idea of the head, intellect, that it will help us to understand what is good for us spiritually. That will help us to grow spiritually. That is the use of the head. And to whom does this head belong? To me personally. I have a head. If I have not lost it, I have a head. So it belongs to me. It is not talking about someone else. It is talking about me. I can practice this. And the scriptures are there to help us from their experiences, which is based on a very high class, high class analysis. The analysis is that the other day I was reading in one of the medical magazines that uh, they tested uh, one medicine on 11,000 people. They wanted to see if it is in any way helping re the, to reduce the chances of heart attack. So it is a kind of experimentation based on this uh, some uh, practical uh, uh, practical uh, they say that uh, their applications in many people's lives. So through that statistics, they come to this point that this is good or this is bad. So when the scriptures say that these things are not good for your spiritual liberation. It is not that they are talking about some fantastic or some fantasies, some fantastic ideas or some fantasies. They are talking about what is practical, what is statistically proved to be good. So this is very much scientific. In many, uh, many a time we face some questions that whether the spiritual teachings are based on some rigorous um, analysis or rigorous experimentation. We support it is like this. And a very big number of statistical support is there to say that this is good and this is not good for our spiritual life. So Swami Vivekananda stressed that point and Sri Krishna also has stressed in the Gita that we have to use our head, use our intellect and to find out what is good for us, for our spiritual development and to achieve our spiritual goal, which can be called this freedom, freedom from suffering or freedom from bondage. Now, <coughs> coming down one step further, we find our heart. And he is talking about heart, which is the center of all our emotions. And this has got two yogas combined here. The Raja Yoga, which teaches us, or the Patanjali Yoga, which will teach us how to meditate, how to concentrate. I mean, how to bring our mind to the point where it will be able to focus on this subject which is good for us. There may be some things going on around me, people are not talking good things. I can shut my ears and concentrate on my book. It is just like that. The people who are meditating, they are not closing their ears with the earbuds or these things. They are shutting down their indriyas or the instrument which is called hearing. So that is the idea of the Yoga Sutra in very, very crude way, this I can explain. And then <coughs> the path which is known as devotion or bhakti yoga. It is also combined with this dhyana. When you do the uh, repetition of the mantras or you do all uh, ritualistic things to worship God, one thing is that the rituals, rituals, sometimes we think the rituals mean that uh, some kind of acts we do which have no meaning. Actually, that is very, very wrong. See, when we are having a national day, we unfold our national flag, flag and then we give some gun salute, chant the national anthem. 
But when you are saluting the national flag, what is it? Just a, a cloth with some colors. Does not make any sense to salute a cloth and a color. But it makes sense when you think that there is an ideal behind that cloth. It represents the ideal of a country, the culture of a country. So therefore you are saluting that culture. It is not that you are saluting that piece of cloth. Rituals are like that. If you are trained in some rituals, you will see that they are so perfectly done that when someone is doing puja, moving hands and hands in different postures, they have got their physical benefits. First thing, when you are doing exercises, you move your hands this way, legs this way, that way, they have got their physical benefits. So why do you call them rituals? They are beneficial. And you need them. Because this way, your mind is brought to the point where you are and what you are doing. You are concentrating. And you are not concentrating on something which is useless, which has no value in your spiritual life. Because you are always remembering that you are doing it for God or for some good purpose. That is why the Upanishads say that Shraddhaya Deya, when you are giving something, you give it with respect. Ashraddhaya Adeya, do not give something with, without respect. So someone comes and wants something from you, you are ready to give or you are able to give, give it with respect, but just throw it to them. You don't need to do it, but when you do it with respect, that is an act of kindness. Otherwise not. Otherwise not. So therefore when you are practicing all these rituals, moving your fingers, hands, etc. in different postures, that has a spiritual benefit that your mind is now there because you have to do it exactly as it is taught. So when you are practicing the ritualistic bhakti also devotion, in the ritualistic form, it has got tremendous meaning. So, when we are doing it, it helps us to improve our mental condition. We will be happy, after the puja, we will be happy to think that we have done something good. That is a good feeling inside. The feeling that I have done, seen, done something bad, that is a bad feeling. That is how the idea of this uh, ethics has come. What is ethical? Immanuel Kant has said, Swami Vivekananda has also said, that uh, universal, that should be some universal imperatives. The thing which you can done, can be done by anyone or everyone throughout the world. And you may allow others to do the same thing to you also. That is ethical. Now suppose if I have the right to tell lies, then everybody should have the right to tell lies. And if it is ethical, everyone will be speaking lies. Then practical life is impossible. Impossible. So it is not ethical. Therefore, when the mind becomes pure, that means it has become pure because I am feeling that effect of purity inside. One of the arguments forwarded by Immanuel Kant is that suppose someone is stealing, the habit of stealing, whether it is ethical or not, or not, if you ask this question, then you have to test it. So, first thing it is, is it allowed that everyone can steal? steal? So, no, not allowed, because it is, I don't allow someone to steal or break into my home. So, another the, the great um, test of it is that the people, the feeling that I am a thief is not a good feeling. Not a good feeling. How do you feel yourself? See, the spirituality is bringing ethics also in the concept of spiritual practices. How do you feel yourself? This is in Sanskrit or in the scriptural language called Swasangetya Lakshana. It is an indication by yourself. You understand by your own feeling. So when you feel that you are getting purified after doing puja, you feel 
the holiness inside, in your mind, some good feeling comes. That is what is talking about. So it has a purpose. It is not purposeless. The rituals are also, even in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, you will see that they have propagated this idea of ritual. So Patanjali says that yoga means you have to control your mind. The modifications of the mind have to be controlled. But at the same time, it is not that easy for everyone to do it according to the, the instructions of Patanjali. So Patanjali made a compromise with the uh, people who would be practicing and said, so if you can't do that, then go for the next one, which is the most golden path. That Ishwara Pranidhana Dva. Or you can do it through offering the fruits of your action to God. So he brings God there. <coughs> that is Bhakti Yoga. So Bhakti Yoga and Patanjali Yoga, they can be, um, in short, you can say that they can be combined. And the, um, the outward expression of that will happen in the region of our heart. The emotional feelings will change. Suppose the mother is uh, uh, trying to save the child. So when the child has fallen, the mother will try to um, take the child into the arms. Even if the child has fallen in the dirt, but the mother will take up the child and put into her lap. So, Without caring for the fresh dress which she is wearing or anything. So that is a, a kind of showing love to one's own child. But if the same mother can do it for somebody else's child, then that is called really the good. Because that has evolved your inside. Otherwise, anyone can do this for one's own relatives or own people, so to say. But if you can do it for everyone, then it becomes a virtue like that. So Patanjali has said that uh, if you practice this uh, meditation and devotion to God, these two are also going to help you. And where is it uh, located? The outward expression will be there in you, in your own heart. You are not borrowing somebody else's heart. Is your heart, which is feeling that. Then the third thing, as Swami Vivekananda has pointed out, that the hands. And that is one of the greatest contributions of Swami Vivekananda that he has spoken on Karma Yoga. It is a wonderful, wonderful method to achieve all the three together. All the three. When we are doing any work, any work, we have to understand that karma yoga does not exclude any kind of work. Then it is called karma yoga. If it gives a list of exceptions that these things do not come under karma yoga, then it is not karma yoga at all. So karma means what? Whatever actions humans do, that is called karma. And yoga means that action will be able to take us, connect us to our spiritual goal, whatever it may be. Holy Mother said that uh, when you are sweeping the floor, respect the broom. And that I have seen. You have seen also here in Japan and Germany particularly have seen. They are respectful to each and every instrument. After the use, they will clean it properly and keep it at the proper place with that respect, because they look at work as worship. The way we do worship in the shrine or temple, they do their work like that, but without knowing that it can be actually oriented towards our spiritual liberation. That they don't know. So this connection has to be given. So this is a wonderful philosophy because it connects us directly to spiritual life. Whatever you do, there is no question of what you are doing whatever you do. That can be connected with our spiritual life, provided we are pursuing a spiritual goal in through our life. That is one condition. 
If we are following a spiritual goal in life, then whatever we are doing, that could be called spiritual practice. Whatever we are doing. And when we are doing things with our hands, that is the best way to engage our mind, body and soul together. Mind, body and head together. All these faculties can be brought together in the practice of this small work. You see, in the life of Holy Mother, there were so many such examples. Once, uh, some of the guest devotees who were staying in Jaramati, and uh, they were there, and uh, the uh, two devotees, they could not sleep at night because it was uh, some summer uh, time, and at night it was very really hot. And in those days, there was no a fan or anything to cool inside the room. So the devotees, two devotees came out of their uh, rooms and then they saw that uh, at a distance uh, one light is glowing uh, on the pathway. They were a bit astonished. Why that lamp has come there? So they went towards that lamp and slowly as they were going towards that lamp they saw that someone is doing something there and they came much nearer and then they saw that it was the Holy Mother and she was doing something on the pathway then they asked Mother what are you doing then she said oh you are here well there are some thorns and some small stone chips on the way and you people walk from your rooms to the temple, so to the shrine, barefoot. So these things will hurt your soul, the feet, below the feet, the soul of the feet. That's why I'm removing that. But uh, why at night? Then the, she said, because daytime, too much other works are there, but night it is quiet and not many people are walking here. It is very quiet, so it is easy to do. So why are you doing You could have asked us, then mother smiled and said, whole day you people are doing so many things, I have no work. And so I am doing this. See, now see who is doing this holy mother. And what is she doing? Not meant for her. It is not meant for her, it is meant for somebody else. And she is doing what? It is very, 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 means you cannot uh, say that it is a very high class work, <laughs> low class work, that she is doing. So see how the highest ideal could be put into practice at a very ground level. She had her feet anchored on the ground and her ideal touched the sky. And that is why we accept her as Holy Mother. Each and every part of her life was born like that. And because what she did that was converted into a spiritual practice, a sacred act. So this uh, idea of Karma Yoga, it is a wonderful idea. And Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, has con have converted this into a Seva Yoga. Seva Yoga is something which is a bit different from Karma Yoga. In the concept of Karma Yoga, we do Karma and offer the result of our actions to God, to the feet of the Lord. And Swami Vivekananda said that, uh, no, you take up any work as your spiritual practice, sadhana. Then what happens? That uh, it is directly connected with uh, your spiritual practice. That is one thing. Now, if you do that work, if you do that work as a service as Holy Mother was doing for others, that is why to serve man is to serve God. That is what he has said. He said that I am the worshipper of that God who by the ignorance is called man. So when you are seeing God in people, Actually, what are we doing? We are practicing the head or the Jnana Yoga, that all is Brahman. All is Brahman. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is within you. 
If the kingdom of heaven is within you, that means it, it is within everyone. And what is there within everyone? The same kingdom of heaven. There are seven billion people on the face of the earth. We cannot say that there are seven billion types of heavens. No, the kingdom of heaven is one, and that lives in everyone, within you. And that is the idea of non-dualism or Advaita, that that holy reality is living in all of us. So when I am doing any good to you, am I really doing good to you? It is doing good to myself. Because the more I know myself, the more spiritual I become, the more purified my become, my mind becomes, I'll be able to see that others too are Brahman. And there is the same kingdom of heaven in others too. Therefore, what happens that all our acts or actions will be a vehicle to lead us to our spiritual liberation. And it is an act of worship. That's why Swami Vivekananda has said that when you look upon all human beings as a manifestation of God, in a different way, each one has a different type of manifestation that is due to our own individuality. As an individual, we, each one of us are different. But inside all, all of us, we are humans, we have the same blood flowing, we uh, have the same genes there. So, Swami Vivekananda has said that when you are worshipping, when you are helping others, you think that you are worshipping God, trying to reach that God or that kingdom of heaven within each one of others. Then what will happen? You are serving God directly. You don't have to offer the fruits of your action to God, someone is who is sitting in the heavens or somewhere else. What you are doing, you are worshipping God directly in front of you. There is no question of offering the fruits of your action to God. No question. It is done to Him that. Done to Him. And whatever result comes, that is through His grace. He liberates us. There is no question of getting the result of our action. It is a direct means of God realization. This thing was uh, discussed by Sri Krishna in the Gita in a very, 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 very methodical way, but not in such a simple way. I will try to touch upon that a bit so that we understand why Swami Vivekananda was so fascinated by this idea of Karma Yoga. And he was one of the best teachers of it because he brought those ideas in simple terms to the general masses. So what the Gita says, Gita says that um, most of the time we are much, much influenced by the result of the action. If I do this thing, what is there afterwards for me? What I will achieve? What is the incentive? Why should I do this thing? So our mind is oriented towards the outcome of this. Now there is the problem. When I am doing something, I am always expecting a result. And what is the result? Now I am doing it because of the incentive that it promises that it will give me this, $1,000. So I am doing this. But So my mind is fixed on $1,000, which is the result of this action. Sri Krishna says that is so wrong. In the second chapter of the Gita he says, the result of any action will not be a success always. Now see, what is so practical here? Whenever you do something following some wrong steps or wrong way of research, it is not, it is not guaranteed that you will get a success, you will get a failure. So Alva Edison was one of the greatest scientists. So when uh, his lab was uh, caught fire, and it was burning and there was a big fire. Then he was enjoying that fire from a distance. And then uh, his son came and said, Dad, everything is burning. Then he said, call your mom quickly. She would be able to find such a spectacular <laughs> event in her life. So call her quickly. And uh, then say, what are you saying? All, everything, our everything is being burned. 
Then he said, yes, I know that. And with that, is being burnt all, are being burnt all my mistakes. And I will start anew without those mistakes. Mistakes are there as the result of any war. You know, he had more than 100 patents. I, I don't know if any other scientist has, and he never went to the university. So, this, uh, this is how Sri Krishna also says that the result of any action is not a success. So why do you put your mind into a success? It could be a failure and that too is a result of any action. That too is a result. So if you are fixated with a success as the result, then you are actually making a big mistake. Why? When you reach the goal or when you reach the end of your endeavor and it is not a success, then what happens? you break down under that blessing. You break down. You are not ready to accept it as an outcome, as a natural process, as a mechanical process. You attach your own emotion with that. And what happens when you attach your emotion to any, any action, then what happens? Suppose there is a problem and I attach my emotion to that problem, then I cannot decide on that matter. Because there is a conflict of interest. Those who understand law, they will know that these people are not allowed to decide on this because there is a big conflict of interest. You have attached your emotion because you have attached your own selfish ideas in that, selfish calculation in that. So what will happen, you know, then you become part of the problem. Problems are there, actions are there. If we attach our emotion to those problems or actions, we become part of the problem. We cannot solve it. We cannot solve it. Sri Ramakrishna says that these, there are some um, people who try to remove or drive away the ghost. And what they do, they use some mustard seeds, throw the mustard seeds on the ghost or the on the person who has been caught by a ghost. So what happens? The mustard seeds will remove the ghost. Now problem is that, Sri Ramakrishna says, the ghost is there in the very mustard seed which you, are, which you are using. Then how can you remove the ghost? It is there in the mustard seed. It is like that. Problem is there in us. We think that success is a result. So if it is a failure, are you ready to offer that to the feet of the Lord? Yes. Because Sri Krishna has said, in the beginning of your work itself, you try to say that whatever happens, I will accept it as the will of God. Then you will see, you have no problem, because whatever happens, it is the will of the God, because you are not calculating on that and not focusing on the result you will be focusing on the means, then your work will be done in a better way. You are not completely engrossed with something which is far, far away from you. You will be taking care of each and every part of the means. And then the result will be there. And if the result does not come as you wanted, you will lose yourself. You know it is the will of the God, therefore, you don't mind. But if you are, Sri Ramakrishna says that if you are really sure that you are 100% dedicated to the will of the Lord, it will have a success. And what is that success? I have seen many times, you see, when you are going through, you are trying to find out some project, to do your research, to do your PhD, something, you Google that idea, that project, and try to find out whether this, this uh, idea will be proper for this project. Then you see that you get some, some uh, already some people have tried on that and they have reported that after six months they found that this is useless. They met with a failure. And that helped you to exclude that from the scope of your 
easy. That failure is a success because it did not allow you to make a false step. That is a success. And we learn from the mistakes of others that way. So that we don't commit it ourselves and spend unnecessary time after something which is invalid. So therefore, the idea of karma yoga is that you are doing it by yourself, by your own hands, your body. And bhakti yoga is that you are doing it by your own mind and your meditation. And jnana yoga is that you are doing it by your own head and by your own understanding of something. And you know how to differentiate between what is good for you, what is bad. What is permanent, what is important. So that way, Swami Vivekananda's great contribution that he made that high-sounding philosophies which people had to always trust or believe in. He said, no, you can do it by yourself and see that it is real. When you are doing something by yourself, you will see that it is possible to do it. It really brings about the result it has promised to us. So this is how I would look at Swami Vivekananda's contribution. There are many varieties of contributions, but this is one of the greatest contributions I have seen. And you see that when a small group like here, we are trying to practice those things in our life. So if we are able to practice this here in a small group, it can be practiced by a bigger group also. Swami Vivekananda has said that the microcosm is built on the same plan as the macrocosm. This small atom is built on the same plan as the big universe, because the universe is nothing but the aggregate of atoms. It is exactly like that. So if a small group, we don't bother how big the group is, but if a small group can practice this in its day-to-day uh, -day life as you know, a spiritual practice, and it can be also practiced by a bigger group, by the idea, by, by the world. And that is what is known as universal imperative, categorical imperative, he says, Immanuel Kant. Means it can be practiced by anyone at any part of the world, any time. It will be called still ethical. So, this is how Swami Vivekananda has made the high sounding or uh, very high spiritual ideas practicable in the day to day life of anyone at whatever level we are. Swami Vivekananda says, take a person by the hand where he or she stands and give him a lift if you can. Spirituality comes to you at whatever level you are there, the beginning will be there from that standpoint, from that level. They say that a beginner has a beginning. A beginner has a beginning. If you feel that you are a beginner, you have a beginning. And if you feel that you are already level up, then there is no beginning. That is a very good um, so disturbing idea. So, spirituality is meant for everyone at whatever age you might be. Shokracharya was uh, going to take some bath in the Ganges and he was he saw that someone was memorizing the formula of Sanskrit grammar. You know the famous line Nahi Nahi Rakshati Dukhin Karne. So in the third case ending in the application of that this Dukhin will be utilized like that. Samasari says just start practicing the, the repeating the name of God, Bhajagovinda, Bhajagovinda. Repeat the name of God. At this age also, the old man is trying to be there. At this age also, you can have a beginning. Because wherever you are there, at that time, you can start. So, so much of the words of hope it brings to us that it is practical for everyone. And it is a life-giving spiritual ideal that Swami Vivekananda has put before us to be practiced. So thank you once again. I am really very happy to be with you to share some ideas with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
any questions, uh, you are welcome, but please uh, do speak a little louder so that you can be captured uh, in, the, uh, in the recording. So please, please keep your question brief. Uh, and then you give the mic to Maharaji. You give the uh, mic to Maharaji so that he can answer. You shut it down, Maharaji. I, I can open it now. Hello. After the insightful lecture from Swami Baneshananda Ji Maharaj Ji, uh, Professor Ranjana Bhattacharya from Delhi has uh, done a song for us on the occasion of the birthday of Swami Vivekananda. Please enjoy this devotional song uh, sung beautifully by from New Delhi, India. Thank you. A new man of God has arrived. He is full of sacrifice and con has convinced everyone of the oneness of God. People call him by different names. <laughs> Shri Krishna, Jai Kali Shri 
এসেছে নতুন মানুষ দেখবি যদি আয় চলে